I was really hoping to find a key to the person standing in front of me, to trust me, to believe in me. And I knew that this to happen, I first had to tell his or her excellency or whoever he or she was, I am interested in you. I would like to understand you. I would like to share your experiences. And after he or she finished speaking, I was hoping to introduce myself and to share my experiences with her or him. And now, here I am standing in, 100, in front of 193 member states and observers so dear to my heart, and I feel the trust. And I have to tell you, I will always cherish this moment in my life, what probably I have been working throughout my whole life. What I would like to promise you, that I will be always open. I will be always there to listen and to understand. And I always think about Confucius who said, life is so simple, we just always make it more complicated. Actually, if we look at each other, if we really listen, if we start talking and start listening, so we really start communicating with each other, life will be much more simple. Before anything, please allow me to dedicate this moment to my husband, Tomas. Because honestly, he believed in me before I did. And he gave me freedom. And he supported me throughout the 30 years of incredible journey with his shining intellect, vision, and humor. And of course, I would like to dedicate this moment to my son, Tomasz Laszlo, because he gives me the constant sunshine. <laughs> and he told me, what does it mean to be responsible throughout your whole life? And also, what is unconditional love? And of course, I really feel that somewhere my dear parents are also smiling down at me. Okay, lovely girl, you did it. So thank you very much for being with me. And now the official bit is coming. <laughs> Your Excellency, dear Mr. President of Hungary, Mr. Parschmidt, what a great honor it is for me to welcome the president of my country. Thank you so much for coming. Mr. President of the 35th General Conference, my dear friend, Mr. David Zonhebron, wherever you sit, you will be my star. Madam Chairperson of the Executive Board, dear Eleonora Mitrofanova, Madam Director General, dearest Irina Bokova, Excellencies, fellow ambassadors, distinguished delegates, honorable representatives of intergovernmental organizations, distinguished representatives of non-governmental organizations, civil society, members of the international press, dear friends, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My election as president of the 36th session of UNESCO's General Conference has granted me a position of great privilege. May I at the very outset express my sincere gratitude for your confidence in my capacity to lead this body and ability to facilitate its important work. 
I should thank the Electoral Group 2 for its unanimous decision to propose me for this position, as well as all the other electoral groups and the European Union for its full support. I would like to thank the Executive Board and all of you today for electing me unanimously. The fact that you have given me the full support only enhances my deep sense of responsibility. I'm also very grateful to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Hungary, which under the guidance of Foreign Minister Dr. Janos Martonyi and Under Secretary Dr. Janos Hovari and their very hardworking team spearheaded a strong external campaign to convince member states to support my candidature. Finally, I am deeply grateful for my lovely colleagues, the team of Hungary here at UNESCO. I know that your trust is placed not only in me, but also in my country, Hungary, which has been an active and creative member of UNESCO since 1948, channeling all its expertise and knowledge into the work of many UNESCO commissions and committees. We also have already had the honor of giving a president of the General Conference in 1974, as well as a chairperson of the executive board in 1997. For Hungarians, UNESCO's mandates are very much at the core of our hearts. I come from a land where our internationally acclaimed thinkers, educators, artists, explorers, not to mention our freedom fighters and Nobel Prize winners, have paved the way for a betterment of the people, not only in my country, not only in Europe, but in the whole world. Our great composer, Béla Bartók said, my guiding philosophy has always been the idea of different nations uniting into brotherhood in spite of all the wars and hostility. I have tried to serve the aim of this idea as best as I can in my music. So for that reason, I do not shrink away from any influences. We Hungarians have always tried to preserve our own culture, yet were forced to absorb any other cultural influences too. But because of our history and geographical position in Europe at the end, I feel that this cross-fertilization with others has proved to be our strengths. It has enabled us to be bold and creative like another of our great musicians, Ferenc Liszt, who, while considering himself a Magyar from cradle to grave, recognized that he had developed his creativity through his contact with the world at large and that his music was at the service of all humankind. Throughout his career, he traveled more widely than any other musician in his time, and in his final years, he wrote, my only remaining ambition as a musician is to hurl my lungs into the boundless reel of the future. This is what at UNESCO we are aiming to do, placing our collective skills at the service of humanity and working together a more meaningful and sustainable future. I'm very happy to welcome to our family the new newest associate members, Kurosao and St. Martin. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to address my heartfelt thanks to His Excellency David Zon Hepburn, the President of the 35th Session of the General Conference and Ambassador from the Bahamas, who has shown me the path of fairness, equilibrium, friendship, 
and wisdom. He also reminded me to be terribly well all the times. I highly value his sense of commitment, his excellent accomplishments, the beauty of his personality, and his constant support since my arrival to UNESCO, which coincided with his taking on the presidency two years ago. And my dear friend, I promised you I will do it my way. <laughs> <laughs> to Madam Chair, of the Executive Board, dear Ambassador Eleonora Mitrofanova, I want to express my profound gratitude and appreciation, both as a friend and as a colleague in the Electoral Group 2, for the sensitivity, skills, and professionalism you have demonstrated as leader of the Executive Board and for being instrumental in proposing me for this very job. I have always been inspired by your combined skills of diplomacy, frankness, strengths, which are so often required in our line of work. To Madame Director General, my dear friend Irina Bokova, let me tell you how much I like and enjoy the swing you have created in this house. I love how you can be full of imagination, determination, energy, and strong leadership, and at the same time, how you can also be humble, ready to embrace, and unashamed of the female touch. I was so proud to welcome the first female director general to this house two years ago, who also happens to come from the same part as I am coming from. I would like to remind everybody about the message of Madam Director General at our last Executive Board meeting, namely that the aim of the ongoing reform is to allow the organization to keep up the pace of history and to shape its course to ensure that UNESCO plays its rightful role, that we are visible, that we respond to the needs of the member states. I can assure you, Madam, that I fully support your vision. I feel inspired and motivated by the infectious excitement that is shared by all the members of the board. I will do my utmost to be a real bridge between the governing organs, the member states, yourselves, the secretariat. With the help of clear communication, we must work to restore or maintain the trust between the Secretariat and the Member States. I would like further develop the General Conference role in strategy and policy formulation, as well as streamline its activities. I will also push forward greater participation of all Member States in our work, because I truly believe that only by working together can we achieve our goals. We are one team. Through lively and innovative communication, we will ensure that UNESCO becomes more visible throughout the world. Honor honorable guests, fellow ambassadors, each of my predecessors must have felt thrilled to assume this honorable position, and rightly so. Each session of the General Conference since UNESCO's birth nearly 70 years ago has been marked by tremendous changes occurring in the world. The organization has coped successively with the profound effects of war, the dawn of the nuclear age, the advent of the Iron Curtain, post-war reconstruction and integration, national self-determination movements, and decolonization. So change is nothing new for UNESCO. Nevertheless, in terms of the enormity of the global challenges that confront us, as well as the current opportunity to address those challenges, we live in truly historic times. 
there are reasons for both hope and despair. I personally feel that since the end of the Cold War, the times we are living in now are the most challenging. We are seeing a major shifting in the world economy, the causes and results of the Arab Spring, a global aspiration towards a free, open, correct life, the sensitivity and boldness of the young people of our times, new chance, chances for democracy in the world. But we also can then see rising tension, radicalism, ruthless power to enforce special interests. A young man set himself in fire, but the fire has not gone out yet. Clear communication, helping everyone to develop sustainable human development, human capabilities, as Nobel Prize laureate Amartya Shen from India would say, are key tasks for all of us. The availability of education is a basic ground for human functioning through which we have a choice for understanding and international cooperation. An American statement, William Fulbright said, in the long course of history, having people understand your thought is much greater security than another submarine. We have other pressing challenges to meet, namely to achieve internationally agreed upon development goals, especially those that fall squarely within the mandate of the organization. This will be difficult given the economies of many member states. The clock is ticking. Only four years remain until the deadline of 2015 for achieving the Millennium Development Goals as well as UNESCO's Dakar goals of universal education and reduced levels of extreme poverty, hunger, and disease. David Zenhebern, in his 2009 acceptance speech, reminded us of UNESCO's role as lead organization for the United Nations Decade of Education for Sustainable Development. He expressed interest in the outcome of the forthcoming UN Climate Conference in Copenhagen and in the importance of strong international cooperation and solidarity in this field. Two years later, with the forthcoming UN conferences in Durban and Rio, it seems to me that we are now starting to have to come to term with the effects of the unbridled pursuit of maximum economic growth, bringing ever increasing and irreversible strains on the planet in all areas. And the need to add new goals such as sustainability, well-being, solidarity, and respect for cultural diversity to traditional goals such as liberty, equality, and fraternity as part of our global mission statement. The 2011 EFA Global Monitoring Report alerts us to another global challenge which is rarely mentioned that demands an international response, namely the state of education in conflict-affected states. The statistics are startling. Countries where there is armed conflict are among the farthest from reaching the education for all goals set in Dakar. Armed conflict is robbing 28 million children of an education by exposing them to widespread sexual violence, targeted attacks on schools and other abuses. We at UNESCO need to give serious consideration to this problem. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, especially close to my heart is the unrelenting fight for gender equality on all fronts. Women continue to be systematically disadvantaged according to the human development indicators. Despite their tremendous potential to foster peace 
nurtures reconciliation and contribute to sustainable development, women everywhere in the world continue to be denied equal access to basic goods and services, to education, employment, and healthcare. Women are particularly vulnerable in their role as primary nurturers in the face of natural disasters and as victims of rape in the event of armed conflict. The empowerment of women and girls in both, is both a great moral imperative of our times as well as an absolute precondition for meeting internationally agreed upon development goals. Fortunately, women around the world have increasingly seen at high level political and decision making positions. Certainly, with my election, we now have three women at the helm of the key sectors of this organization. You have sent a very powerful message to the world that UNESCO is serious about its commitment to promoting gender equality and recognizing the abilities of women. More importantly, you have sent a message to hundreds of millions of girls and women whose voices and hopes are currently unheard, that they too can aim high and realize their dreams. Our message from the top, however strong as it may be, will not suffice. As member states of UNESCO, we must work together towards transforming gender equality from an aspiration into a reality at all levels everywhere. Distinguished delegates, I have enumerated some of the challenges that set the background of our current work. Together, these challenges call for multilateral solutions and remind us that the tasks for which UNESCO was created are yet to be accomplished. We must ensure that UNESCO is versatile enough to cope with the rapidly transforming environment while maintaining its steadfast commitment to its mandate of peace. More specifically, we need to focus on our comparative strengths while coordinating with external partners on finding common strategies. The critical role of science and technology within an ethical framework for developing countries and in particular Africa must be emphasized. We need to realize our organization's constitutional mandates. These include using dialogue to promote peace and the rapprochement of cultures, as well as supporting reconciliation and other measures that impart tolerance and mutual understanding. Given the enormity of the task, intertia and interaction are simply not an option. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I was brought up behind the Iron Curtain in a little Hungarian village called Moor. It lies in a valley between the Bakony and Vertes, two lovely mountains, and is famous for its huge vi vineyards and winemaking tradition. My father was the local doctor, and he taught me, if someone needs you, you have to go whatever hour of the night or day. There are no working hours. In this village, people from different nationalities and ethnic backgrounds used to live together. My father never looked at the color, language, clothing, or traditions, and went whenever and wherever he was needed. His example has shaped my sense of responsibility. What I have also learned through the years is that effective communication is not enough. 
unless it is combined with genuine leadership, we simply will not be able to push through the obstacles standing in our way, and real change will not take place. As a European, my education was influenced by the egocentric thinking of Descartes. I think, therefore I am. Lately, however, I feel that much can be achieved by following an African concept of Ubuntu, which states, I am human because I belong, I participate. A person with Ubuntu is open and available to others and doesn't feel threatened by the apparent strengths and abilities in others. People with Ubuntu have the self-assurance that comes from knowing that they belong to the greater whole. They feel diminished when others are tortured, humiliated, or oppressed. As a Hungarian, I know only too well that survival depends not on the individual, but on the abilities of the collective. Here at UNESCO, we have a global responsibility to lead by example. In these times of social and financial insecurity, in particular, we need to listen to all the voices. It requires great creativity, persistence, and strength in order to survive without losing one's humanity and the smaller and the poorer states have much to teach us. In order to work well together at UNESCO, let's develop Ubuntu. All nations have valuable contributions to make, and together we can achieve more than individually. So, our question is, how can we make these ideas relevant in our everyday work? How can we honor each other's homeland, language, culture, and participating together to make the world a better place for the human, for the future generation? We can start, I think, by emphasizing our cultural diversity rather than our cultural differences. Cultural diversity includes the particular qualities that each nation brings to the expression of its identity. It enriches the greater whole and is something to be celebrated. Culture differences imply division and are often used as an excuse to explain why nothing can change. I believe that culture differences should never become an excuse for an our inability to reach global understanding. We must remind ourselves that there are no cultural differences in the fundamental values of human life. We all want to belong and feel safe, to contribute and be appreciated, and to be able to, buy, to provide for our children. We must teach our children that the people of the world all have much more in common than not, and that is what we should build on. I see our world as a global cultural space, a multi-layered treasure, a magic box full of undiscovered jewels. The process of inspiration followed by the creativity of people working together is to me the most beautiful aspect of this varied cultural space. For a culture to open its doors wide, it must believe in its own strengths, knowing that it is rich enough to nourish other cultures, yet sensitive enough to benefit from other influences. Excellencies, these dear friends, I personally have always had a somewhat problematic perception with politics. 
I used to say that I was more interested in the human motives underlying political decisions. I now realize that what I was always uncomfortable with is the inevitable existence of promoting only political interests. That is why I have become a firm believer in what I call the art of cultural diplomacy. I just would like to remind ourselves that UNESCO was established to contribute to peace and security by promoting collaboration among the nations through education, science, and culture in order to further universal respect for justice, for the rule of law, and for the human rights and fundamental freedoms which are affirmed for the peoples of the world without distinction of race, sex, language, or religion by the Charter of the United Nations. If traditional diplomacy is seen hard, cultural diplomacy is seen soft, but the so-called soft power is not so soft after all, because it channels the wider connective and human values. If traditional hard diplomacy is seen the prose, the soft culture diplomacy is poetry. An American poet, Williams, Carlos Williams wrote, it is difficult to get news from poems, yet men die miserably every day from lack of what is fun there. He reminds us that poetry may not be practical and straightforward, but its less tangible attributes can lead to unexpected revelations that enhance our lives. The poetry of diplomacy allows us to embrace the subconscious and our deepest, most hidden thoughts and feelings. It makes full use of intuition, lateral thinking and creativity, which in our troubled times can lead to surprising breakthroughs where traditional methods have failed. Maybe I feel so, and that way, because I come from a land where poetry always played an important role in our lives. But maybe because I'm a woman. And we women like to deliver ideas, visions, tasks, and babies. <laughs> and we would rather die than see our sons killed or our daughters widowed. So for that reason, we see the goal and we don't mind the change of directions. I hope that the kind of poetry of diplomacy we can enrich our life every day will be a guiding star and light for our life here at UNESCO. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the general conference is a celebration because we are, celebration, we are celebrating each other. So don't forget the joie de vivre. Always have a smile for each other, but please mean it. Merci beaucoup for votre attention. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>